so our final uh, presentation today is uh, from uh, the Astronomer Royal, Martin Rees from Cambridge, and the title of his presentation is Prospects for SETI and the Breakthrough Listen Project. Yes, right. Good. Okay. Well, I think I'm here to uh, lower the tone of the meeting. <laughs> Um, and I can immediately answer Don Lindenbell's question, if he asked me it, uh, because the most exciting discovery would be, of course, discovering ET. Uh, but don't hold your breath. Um, but uh, what I want to say, really, is that um, extraterrestrial life and intelligence have always been fascinating, uh, but they've been on a speculative fringe for a very long time, bordering on science fiction. But in the last few years... Uh, there have been advances on several fronts which make it rather more uh, serious, and they're now becoming almost mainstream, and I'm going to describe some of the uh, uh, recent uh, discoveries. Uh, well, I'd like to start off, though, with a bit of history. Um, speculations about extraterrestrial life go back to uh, ancient times, in fact. And, in fact, in the uh, um, 18th and 19th centuries, it was widely suspected that most other planets were inhabited. In fact, the 19th century arguments were more often theological and scientific. Eminent thinkers argued that life must pervade the cosmos, because otherwise such vast domains of space would have seemed such a waste of space for the creator. <laughs> and, for instance, there's a nice quote from uh, the Scottish physicist David Brewster, remembered for the Brewster angle in physics. He conjectured on these grounds that even the moon must be inhabited. He argued, and I'm going to quote him, that had the moon been destined to be merely a lamp to light our earth, there would be no occasion to variegate its surface with lofty mountains and extinct volcanoes and give its surface the appearance of continents and seas. It would have been a better lamp had it been a smooth piece of lime or chalk. Well, by the end of the 19th century, so positive were many astronomers that life existed elsewhere, that there was a prize set up by a French foundation of 100,000 francs for the first people to detect alien life. And the prize specifically excluded contact with Martians, because that was thought too easy at the time. <laughs> <laughs> because, of course, the erroneous claim that Mars was crisscrossed by artificial canals, had been taken as proof positive of intelligent life on the Red Planet in the late 19th century. Well, the Space Age, of course, brought sobering news. Venus was uh, um, extremely uh, hostile, and Mercury even more so, and even, uh, even Mars, the Red Planet, uh, proved uh, not to be a particularly salubrious place for life, and of course we know very well uh, there have been many uh, uh, studies of it by the Curiosity landing here, sending back pictures of Marscapes like this, um, and uh, we know that it's an interesting landscape, but we know it's not very propitious for any kind of advanced life. And going further out, we have the J Jupiter and its four moons, and uh, here there could be some simple life, something swimming under the uh, uh, ice of Europa, uh, we don't really know. And going to Saturn, then Enceladus, we know there are oceans under the uh, ice here. Again, there could be something swimming there. And uh, uh, these are the uh, methane lakes on Titan. And of course, uh, if you could have methane-based life, not uh, ordinary life, then maybe there could be something there. But no one is, of course, very positive on the idea of any life elsewhere in our solar system, certainly not any advanced life. But the prospects have brightened enormously given what we have discovered about uh, planets around other stars, if we extend our vision beyond our solar system. Because, as everyone here knows, what's transformed and energized the whole field is the realization that stars are orbited by retinues of planets. Most of them are. And, of course, most of the smaller planets, anyway, have been found by the Kepler spacecraft, which spent three and a half years uh, looking at a patch of sky about seven degrees across, monitoring the brightness of 100,000 stars uh, with a precision of one part in 
in 100,000 and looking for transits indicating planets. And it found uh, many thousands of planets. And uh, uh, if you just look at the uh, stars which have more than two planets around them, they're depicted in this rather silly uh, um, depiction here um, where, where everything is to scale. Uh, but this just shows a huge amount of data we have about the planets. And, of course, this is only planets whose um, orbital planes are in the line of sight with the star, so we see uh, transits. So the one thing we have learned is that there are planets around most stars, and in particular, some of these planets are Earth-like, in the sense of being about the size of the Earth, and at a distance from their parent star, such that water neither boils away nor stays frozen. And here are just a couple of systems found by Kepler. Uh, the bottom shows our solar system, and this shows two, uh, two systems, um, which are um, orbiting around fainter stars. And just last August, um, it was found, not by Kepler, but by uh, radio velocities, that there is a planet not much bigger than the Earth around Proxima Centauri, which is a very faint star in the Alpha Centauri system. And this planet has an 11-day year. It's very close in, but because the star is an M dwarf at 100 times fainter than the Sun, it's in its habitable zone. So this is just to remind people that there are, of course, many, many planets, um, and uh, we have no idea about how likely it is that life would have originated on any of them. Because it's important to realize that though we know about the evolution of life from simple beginnings, the origin of life, the transition from complex chemistry to the first metabolizing, replicating systems, is still a mystery. But serious people are now working on it. And, of course, we now expect that there are many candidates for life. We know, roughly speaking, there are about as many stars as planets in the universe, in, in the galaxy, and one in every six stars is probably going to have an Earth-like planet around it. So this still doesn't rule out the possibility that life's unique to the Earth. It could be a rare fluke, but it does suggest that uh, uh, there are lots of locations where the emergence of simple life, at least, is possible. We don't know whether it was likely or not. But another thing that's made, made things possible is that uh, we've learnt something more about life on Earth. Extremophiles have shown that life can exist under a wider range of conditions and temperatures than was thought previously. And that means that a habitable planet uh, could be uh, something still very different from the Earth and the huge numbers of uh, possible planets. But, of course, habitable does not mean inhabited, not even by the simplest life. And so there's a huge uncertainty. And I think these issues about the origin of simple life will soon be clarified because this is attracting serious interest from biochemists. It's no longer deemed to be one of those problems like, say, consciousness, which are put in this sort of too difficult box of not being right for any serious attention. Serious people are now working on it. And as regards observations, um, of course, it's very hard to detect uh, these planets, but uh, it won't be more than a decade or two before it may be possible to look for biosignatures um, by uh, separating out the component of the spectrum from a planet, from the star it's orbiting. Uh, the, the James Webb Telescope may do this, um, and uh, there's an idea of having a um, W first and having this sort of screen to block out the star so you can see the planet more clearly, um, and uh, there may be more futuristic ones. And, of course, when we have the, uh, the ELT, uh, the high-resolution spectrograph may be able to look for the um, uh, signature of a planet um, around one of the nearby stars. And incidentally, that's why it's very important to identify in the next 10 years the closest Earth-like planets, not just the ones that, sh uh, that uh, show transits, because by simple geometry, they're going to be only 1 or 2% of them all. So that's why uh, uh, other projects like TESS and ground-based projects are looking for the nearest Earth-like planets. Well, even if simple life is common, then what does this mean about the possibility of intelligent life? 
It could be that the evolution of life on Earth depends on many contingencies. Um, many people think that the course of life on Earth was uh, influenced by phases of glaciation, the Earth's tectonic history, asteroid impacts, and so forth, and that there may be sort of possible bottlenecks in evolution, going from monocellular to multicellular uh, organisms, uh, and perhaps there were some later uh, transitions where there were these sort of bottlenecks. And even in the complex biosphere, the emergence of intelligence isn't guaranteed. Because, for instance, many people debate that if the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out, uh, then uh, uh, would intelligence have uh, emerged somehow, even if the mammalian chain of evolution that led to us uh, was choked off because the dinosaurs were still there. So we just don't know. And so that's yet another of the uncertainties, piled on uncertainties in this field. Moreover, when we are thinking about whether there could be life out there, uh, we shouldn't be too sort of anthropocentric. We should be open-minded about whether it might emerge in other forms very different from here and in, very, uh, and in other places. So we should devote some thought to non-Earth-like life in non-Earth-like locations. But it plainly makes sense to start with what we know. This is the searching under the streetlight strategy uh, which makes sense, um, and to deploy all available techniques to discover whether any Earth-like exoplanets display evidence for technological life. Moreover, advances in computational power and robotics have led to growing interest in the possibility that artificial intelligence, AI, could in the coming decades achieve and exceed human capabilities and this has stimulated discussions about what forms of inorganic intelligence might exist out there in the cosmos. And I'll come back to that again in a moment. Well, the earliest serious searches for extragalactic intelligence were famously led by Frank Drake, Shklovsky, Sagan, Kardashev, and others. And they, of course, didn't find anything artificial. But, of course, they were very limited, as indeed all searches are limited. It's rather like uh, taking a bucket full of water from the sea and saying that the oceans have no life in them. It's really a very, very incomplete search. And uh, what's uh, made this topic a bit more exciting recently is that the um, uh, breakthrough initiative has been set up by a, a Russian investor called Yuri Milner, and he has uh, committed $10 million a year for 10 years to a systematic search to look for extraterrestrial uh, uh, life and intelligence. And I think this is a serious advance because one day of what this project will do is equivalent to at least a year of any previous searches. So this is a uh, 100 buckets rather than one bucket, if no, no more than that. Um, and uh, uh, I should say that uh, uh, the reason I'm talking about this today is that the, uh, there's an advisory group which I actually am chairman of, which has international members. It has the obvious names like uh, uh, Frank Drake and Jill Tata and Kardashev in it, and also from this country, uh, uh, Chris, Chris Lintot and Mark Garrett. Uh, so it's an international group which tries to advise on how this, uh, this money should be spent. Well, uh, what, what are the, the aims? Um, what's been done so far is to buy time on some existing telescopes. The first thing that's been done, there's a top picture here, is to continue uh, a project already uh, being started by Jeff Marcy at Lick Observatory, uh, which is looking for extremely narrow emission lines that might be artificial from a, as early from a laser um, and uh, looking uh, for, for this for around nearby stars. That's one thing that's being done. And the second and third uh, pictures here show the Green Bank Radio Telescope in West Virginia and the Parks Radio Telescope. And uh, these will go much deeper than Project Phoenix, which was an earlier project in the 1990s. And the approach towards targets is guided really by a number of criteria. First, to sample all major types of stars over a range of masses and elemental abundances and to sample the region of the Milky Way galaxy within 50 parsecs of the Sun, and also to look for galaxies, 
to look at the centres of other galaxies where you're looking at uh, billions of, of stars and, of course, we have no idea whether uh, these uh, signals will be uh, rare, very rare and powerful or not quite so rare um, and, um, and uh, less powerful. So one should target some objects of, of all these categories. And I think also just survey the whole sky because our preconceptions about what's out there are almost certainly uh, far too blinkered. And I should mention that in addition to these three telescopes, there's uh, going to be a search using the, uh, the, the Meerkat array in uh, South Africa, which actually with multi-beam is in many respects rather better, these other two radio telescopes for this search. And also soon in, in, Austra in uh, uh, China, uh, the, the new Super Arecibo telescope is going to be uh, used for some of this. Um, just one slightly technical thing, uh, which is being used uh, by the optical searches. Um, of course, if you look for a narrow line, you've got to, um, you've got to allow for the fact that uh, it may be coming from a planet that's orbiting around and we are going around on the Earth. And therefore, you have to uh, uh, be able to uh, plot the change in the frequency with time. And this just shows a, a test that was done detecting Voyager, which, as you know, is right down at the edge of the solar system. And uh, uh, what this shows is time plotted upwards for about a 10-minute exposure, and the line is shifting by a tiny amount due to the change in the Doppler effect due to the rotation of the um, observatory on the Earth in just 10 minutes. That's a, you're, you're detecting that tiny effect. And if you look at the top, then you see that the smooth curve is what happens if you integrate over that. But if you deconvolve and take the uh, uh, the drift, you can see that there are two spikes there. And the uh, software is going to be able to analyze the, uh, the data um, with this extremely high uh, um, sen sensitivity and also uh, with very precise frequencies so that they can actually detect whether uh, whether something which is moving. And uh, uh, if it is moving, they can still uh, isolate the signal. Well, in the first year of the project, uh, they're going to be looking at about 60 nearby stars, and they're going to look at about 1,600 stars within 50 parsecs, and they're going to look at 120 galaxies. So that's, that's just the start. Well... Of course, it's worth looking at extragalactic objects um, because even if they're very rare, you might be able to detect some of them. And also, there's a new project that's going to look for optical flashes. It's not, not necessarily narrow frequencies, but, but very short time. And uh, Paul Horowitz at ha Harvard is developing a new project to look for that. Well, if we are to detect something, what's it going to be? And here again, we don't know, but I'd like to make two suggestions. One is, it probably won't be from anything organic or biological, and it may come not from anything on a planet at all. And I base this speculation on extrapolating what's going to happen in the far future here on Earth. During this century, the entire solar system is going to... Uh, uh, be explored, of course, uh, and we're going to develop new technologies on Earth. In particular, uh, we're going to uh, develop um, cyborg techniques, artificial intelligence, maybe at human level, and maybe genetic modification, etc. And we may uh, decide to constrain the extent to which this is used here on Earth. But, of course, the other thing that's going to happen is that in a century or two from now, uh, there'll be independent pioneers living in space, probably on Mars or somewhere like that. And whatever ethical constraints we impose here on the ground, we should surely wish these adventurers good luck in modifying their progeny to adapt to alien environments. And this might be the first step towards emergence of a new species, and it might also be uh, the transition from uh, organic to completely inorganic uh, uh, electronic brains, and if the latter happens, then they won't want to be in the plant at all. They might prefer to be on zero G, and they're the things we might detect. Now, how long is it going to take for that to happen? Um, 
Some people say within a century, but most cautious of us say it will take a few centuries. But be it as it may, the timescale for technological change of that drastic kind on Earth is a tiny, tiny fraction of the time lying ahead. We're comparing centuries with billions of years. And what this means, therefore, is that uh, if we were to imagine that there were indeed other um, planets where evolution had tracked roughly what happens here on Earth, then it's highly unlikely that the key stages will be synchronized so that we see it's at the same stage. If it lagged behind because it started later or the, uh, the, the bottlenecks were more severe, then, of course, we'd detect no signal. But if it was ahead, then almost uncertainly we would detect evidence for the intelligence at the stage when it was far beyond the um, uh, stage that we are in, and we would detect um, the futuristic scenario I've just outlined. As I said, the history of human technology is measured in millennia at most, and it may be only one or two more centuries before humans are overtaken or transcended by these inorganic intelligences. So if we detect anything, I think it's important to say that it's unlikely to be a message. It's more likely to be some sort of uh, um, byproduct or even malfunction of some machine created by some long dead civilization. Science fiction authors remind us of all these alternatives. And incidentally, the habit of referring to ET as an alien civilization may be a bit too restricted because civilization denotes a uh, society of individuals. In contrast, ET might be a single integrated intelligence. But of course, in our state of ignorance about what might be there, we should clearly encourage searches in all wave bands. We should look at the optical and x-rays, be alert for artifacts, other evidence of non-material phenomenon, for instance, a Dyson sphere or artificially created molecules such as CFCs, or even maybe a mega ice cat somewhere out there sending its radar towards us. So back finally to SETI, uh, this is what's being done by the, the Breakthrough uh, Project. It's spending this $100 million over 10 years, starting, as I said, with Green Bank and Parkes radio telescopes and Lick in the optical. It's going to look for optical flashes and pulses. It's going to use new instruments. Uh, instrumentation uh, with uh, 20 billion channels, so it can do this very high resolution in lots of uh, objects. And the other point that's going to be done, which is why Chris Lintot's going to be such a key person, is to uh, uh, extend SETI at home so that individuals can uh, um, uh, use some of the data. And of course, given the huge data rate, the question is how you can package it so that individuals can participate. But of course, also, since we don't know what we're looking for, it's very important to have uh, uh, op open minds for serendipitous searches of all kinds. So my view on all this is that these SETI searches are worthwhile, despite their heavy odds against success, because the stakes are so high. And that's why I welcome this donation of private funds. Even the optimists wouldn't bet more than a few percent on detecting anything, and most of us are all pessimistic. But it seems worth the gamble, because at least there's some chance in the lifetime of some people here, there may be some progress. And I was talking to someone just before the meeting about uh, whether there should be public funding for this. Uh, of course, there traditionally hasn't been any. It's been funded by a succession of private philanthropists, and, uh, uh, and that's fine. But on the other hand, I don't see why there shouldn't be public funding, because uh, if you were to take um, uh, an opinion poll of people coming out of some science fiction movie and ask would they be happy if a bit of the tax from that were hypothecated for a SETI search, I think quite a lot would say yes. And incidentally, it's the astronomers who are the least positive about SETI, for good <laughs> but for good reason, because um, if it's perceived as part of astronomy, then, of course, more money for SETI is less money for them, and observing time for SETI, as on these telescopes, um, is less observing for them. And I think it's very important that if it is to receive any public funding, which it isn't yet, that should be regarded not as astronomy, but as something of interest to a much wider community than astronomers. Otherwise, there's bound to be a, a tension um, between us uh, as astronomers in whether we want to support this or not. But finally, there are two familiar maxims which pertain to this quest. One is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And the second is that absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Martin, for uh, taking us uh, uh, to such uh, realms of imagination. Right. I can see. Uh, okay. Right. Um, two, two comments. The first on contingency. It's worth remembering yes. that the theropod dinosaurs didn't become extinct. And if the weather was a little better, one would probably be singing in Berkeley Square. Yes. There is a species of South American parakeet, apparently, which has approximately the same intelligence as the bonobo, our nearest mammalian <laughs> intellectual yep. rivals, approximately equal, apparently, to that of a bright four-and-a-half-year-old human. And this suggests that, like flight, intelligence has the potential to develop such as to be encouraged to occur whenever there's an yep. opportunity, yes. perhaps more than once. Yes. Second, when it comes to the search for uh, extraterrestrial search for high intelligence, yes. there's an additional reason for funding shown by recent political events. <laughs> the search for intelligent life on Earth has proved a disastrous failure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm. Well, some people say that we haven't detected things because that's true of these others as well, of course. Uh, but of course, if we're going to detect something, it's got to have a technology in advance of ours that be psychologically sufficient like us that it wants technology. It's no good if they're li living a contemplative life under some ocean. We won't detect them. Yes, so over here. Yeah. So, Anne. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. microphone. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. My question is really simple, actually. How far, or in terms of light years, will we be able to detect, do you think, using the uh, forthcoming telescopes yes. like EELT? Hmm. Well, it, it it's absolutely depends on what the source is. We don't know. Um, uh, something, uh, um, the Earth's artificial radars could be detected at the distance of a nearby star by something like Arecibo. Um, at the other extreme, the sort of um, uh, Hughes laser, which uh, Yuri Milner is trying to uh, promote to send a small probe to a near, near a star, would be uh, powerful enough to be detected at an extragalactic distance. And you can imagine Kardashev's type three civilizations, etc. So, so uh, it simply depends on what the, what the power is. And since we don't know uh, what the chances of these powerful things, we should look for everything. And I think it's important to spend some fraction of the time not looking just at the nearby stars anyway, but uh, scanning distant galaxies. Martin, let me just ask you, if, if, yeah. if I remember correctly, you had some years ago cautioned against us as humans broadcasting. Um, um, no? No, no, it is Martin Ryle and Stephen Hawking have both said that. But, no. but, 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 You're but, not guilty. No, and, and actually I find it hard to, to take that idea seriously um, because I think if there really were um, uh, in terms of aliens, they would know all about us already. Um, and uh, uh, they, they'd still want to know some things about us. I mean, they'd know all our science, but what they'd like to know if they did come here is about our biosphere, because they, they'd know about evolution, but they couldn't predict all the creepy crawlies and all the life in the oceans and on, on the land. That's what they'd want to know if they came. But I don't worry about letting them know we're here. They probably know already if they're there. Sorry, I yeah, accused okay, you of that, that. yes. No, no, no. <laughs> um, having followed this search for about half a century yes. now with great interest, um, I'm rather sort of have to ask the question, yes. how long do we go on searching before we draw a blank, before we decide if we've drawn a blank of what Paul Davis in a recent book called The Eerie Silence? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I would say that uh, um, obviously there's a, it depends on how many people want to try. I mean, do you want to go on trying even if you think that the chance is small? But what I would say is that um, as we have more and more powerful telescopes, more powerful techniques, then it would be good to use a bit of the time on those instruments to deepen the search, because uh, just as the breakthrough project is going to deepen the search compared to 20 years ago, uh, so we know that we'll have deeper searches in 20 years' time. So uh, I think we should keep on going, because however much we do, it'll be only a tiny, tiny fraction of parameter space that we're exploring. 
Okay, this must be the, the final question. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that, Martin. Um, th th there seems to be a trend, though, in communications these days to going encrypted and spread spectrum, which is going to be a lot harder to pick up. So it seems to me that what we've really got to catch is that transient phase when somebody's going through what we went through, you know, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, have you any thoughts about how we're going to catch that? Well, well, I think I should have said clearly that I think even if we detect something that's manifestly artificial, the likelihood that it's a message of any kind, still less a message we can decode, is very small. I think it's more likely to be some, uh, some lasers or some malfunctioning machine or something like that. But, of course, uh, your, your point is an important one, um, that uh, uh, if there was a message then we wouldn't know how to decode it because, I mean, radio engineers uh, who'd never heard about uh, um, FM would be, would be flummoxed by, by present-day techniques. And, of course, the other point is that the, uh, uh, the optimum signal compression is to make something as like noise as possible. And so, for all those reasons, obviously, it's hard. Um, so I think you've got to be an ultra-optimist to think that we'll detect a message that's aimed at us uh, and... Uh, uh, intended for us to understand. So uh, I would think there's a very low chance of that, but what I do think is worth looking for is um, uh, some evidence for something which is artificial, a very narrow band signal, some kind of pulses, or even, of course, we should look for uh, more exotic things, artifacts. I mean, there was this, this star found by Kepler, which, uh, in fact, is natural but looked peculiar. We might find something peculiar, and uh, we might find some uh, asteroid that's specially shiny and spherical or something like that. <laughs> no, no idea. But we should keep our lookout for things of that kind. Well, thank you very much, Martin. Clearly, you've stimulated us all. So can we thank Martin and, in fact, all of the speakers? Thank you. Thank you.